Our next speaker is Baruch Halpern from the University of Georgia, formerly of the University of Pennsylvania, uh, not, no, from Penn State University, also formerly from UCSD. And he's going to speak on the Omerta on the Exodus. Thank you. Look, the Exodus as a historical issue is essentially a faith issue. Um, we can ask, did God exist? Does God exist? Um, did the Exodus exist? We ask those questions about other things as well. We ask them about ghosts. We ask them about demons. We ask them about alien abductors. I don't know if you've noticed, but those are the incubi of the 20th century. Um, we ask, too, will it work? No, I need it. Hold on. Wait a minute. We're going to get it. OK. Um, what we're starting with is poetry. Uh, and it's marriage with science, when we ask these questions, bids us to ask, how far does knowledge propel imagination? And how far does a scientific imagination parallel? Uh, um, further knowledge, thank you. Um, well, how do I get from here to there? Oh. there. You want to just advance it? Yeah, no, I need to play this one. Oh. Sorry about that. Okay. Thank you. They all laughed at Wilbur and his brother when they said that man could fly. They told Marconi, wireless was a phony. It's the same old pride. OK, so um, the, uh, you all know the positions that we've had laid out for us about the exodus as an event. Um, I think most of the people here think that it happened to those on the Mayflower um, or to the entire Israeli army, according to Aaron Mayer, um, that Passover was Israel's annual turkey dinner. Um, if you're ecumenical about it, Israel had a DAR. If you're puritanical, Team Moses was just Boston Brahmins. Um, for such an emendation of biblical historical claims, my favorite uh, biblicist is named uh, Ephraim Kishon, <clears throat> who cites a passage from Amos uh, about the whole family that I lifted up from Egypt and concludes that the exodus consisted of a Zeta, a Bubby, a Mama, a Daddy, and one child of each gender. It was six people. Let me dilate on that. Uh, a contemporary historian describes the uh, last days of St. Cuthbert at Lindisfarne Monastery as solitary, except for his healing a monk. About 25 years later, uh, the venerable Bede uh, says he heard the abbot elaborate communications on such issues as th uh, the abbot, he heard from the abbot that Cuthbert elaborated communications on such issues as the proper date for Easter and delivered a number of sermons. Um, Philip Jenkins describes the discrepancy as his introduction to historical criticism with the emolument that we know who to blame for the elaboration. Or, in 1937, uh, in a study of historiography, <laughs> a witness reviews his testimony about having seen a horse in a cart. Uh, but the testimony changes as he goes on. The horse becomes a zebra, then the cart a chariot. By the end of the story, you end up with quite a carnival. carnival. Uh, and then poor Marco, who has painted this elaborate picture of what he's seen en route from school sheepishly reports to dad, nothing, I said, growing red as a beet, but a plain horse and wagon on Mulberry Street. When Theodore Seuss Geisel first wrote to think that I saw it on Mulberry Street, 
He entitled it A Tale That No One Can Beat, which uh, Professor Osman has described the Exodus as. And it is how several texts portray the Exodus. Uh, theologians call this incomparability. Now we know uh, the practical facts exist. Um, Egypt was an eternal presence uh, from, for 400 years it dominated southern Canaan and enlisted its elites. Um, we have a report that two slaves fled out the Wadi Tumalot, it's in Anet. Uh, that may be routine police blotter material or actually it could be the exodus. Um, all I can say for the 50th time in this conference is that the story is typologically true. It interprets Egypt. Um, one guy who was formerly a desert rat claimed he escaped. Um, now, that desert element along the lines of Avi Faust's presentation is pretty important because uh, we don't take enough account of the uh, romantic role uh, of desert sojourns, of nomadization in the cultures that produced this kind of story. Uh, to have braved the life of the desert is a badge of courage. Um, but anyway, the desert rat escaped. Um, some guy saw sorcery and knew it was fake. Some guy saw a four-room house. Another guy found a louse. And one little piggy squeaked, Egyptian sank. Okay. In the story, in the base, I think uh, the Bible identifies Joseph with the Hyksos. But storytellers formulated an Israelite national myth. They festooned it with spectacle and humor. Man, those Egyptians always running in the wrong direction, just like the Nile. Uh, and the sea returned to a high tide just as they cut across it. <laughs> they threw in sound effects. Uh, they mystified. They edified. They explained Pesach and circumcision and whatnot. Um, they, they told the story. They performed the story creatively inside family units. Let's stress that. What we've got for the Exodus in the Bible are scores or even scripts from J, E, P, Exodus 15 and elsewhere, an illusion. But this story was performed in individual households, maybe most of them elite, but with gullible, willing dependents to mobilize. Say even 5,000 households. I'm pulling that number out of my uh, hat. That's 5,000 versions each year, every year, minimum, of tellings of this story. That's where our scripts are coming from, and that's even before the editors got at them. Now, we don't just have gods, to go back to the beginning. We sell them. We might have faith what Ezekiel saw or wonder if he mistook it. Uh, we can't know if anyone saw a sea divide. I was going to say that if we personally see the sun stop, OK. But maybe that's just a slow day, too. We sell gods to ourselves or to others on say-so, or as Kipling would say, just so, or as Pogo would say, so-so stories. But children's literature does not get our historical dander up until it gets into court. Then it becomes a question of homo usios versus homo usios. Homer was taken literally by the Greeks, as St. Augustine relates. Um, Homer, like the Bible, underwent gen ge uh, migration in genre. My instinct is there was an exodus. But my instinct is also it bore no resemblance to anything in any ancient account and little to anything in, his, in critical scholarship. Let's take the pharaoh down a peg. Let's make him a nomarch. Nah, let's make him a mayor. Nah, let's make him the head of a brewery. Do I believe there was an exodus? I can't answer that question. 
It's easy to see the historical kernel of Little Red Riding Hood. Little girl goes through the wood and grandma pops out at a wolf. But did Hansel and Gretel really lose signal on a primitive GPS system? Breadcrumb three. Do our autumn gingerbread houses celebrate liberation from child sacrifice? For those of you who answer yes, Tom is serving magic beans for dinner. All right, let's consider how we, how we study this thing historically when we're studying it as event, okay? It seems as though the Israelites were very careful with their garbage as they crossed the Sinai, uh, taking it with them, uh, apparently. Um, when, when we discuss this issue, um, the Bible is our addressee. Um, or we modify the scale, date, the events, uh, cite terrain, goods, language, names, all sorts of Egyptian background. Uh, and here the meta-narrative meta ad address C is not the Bible, but our first group who think that discrediting a detail discredits the story. Uh, in unison, we shake our heads at their lack of sophistication. Um, at the least, we can do tradition history. We intuit that the language, our language is, is charged. What it is is church polemics. Now, <clears throat> even on workaday subjects, responsible scholars can have bizarre opinions. That is the history of our field. But we never hear about comets and volcanoes and red tide. I'll name a few others in a minute, in connection with Josiah's reform. Okay, some people say it never occurred. Um, some compare David to King Arthur. But I've not encountered anyone saying that Hulda trans translated Josiah to Avalon or that the Witch of Endor summoned up an alien abductor. Although there was the myth that Caesar rose on the third day or Nero went to India which does suggest a certain poverty of imagination in the field. These things should be suggested. Even Troy has its Mudville moments. The mighty alien, abductor, divine intervention, explanations of invisibility and invulnerability have struck out there as well. Now, the, the exceptionalism of the Exodus sometimes reflects the fact that the issue is complex. We have various sources. We try to date the sources. Uh, one example being P, which is probably the one on which the greatest consensus obtains, and even that one uh, is dated between, and I think responsibly, uh, between the time of Hezekiah and um, sometime in the post-exilic period. Um, but the most Misunderstood principle in biblical studies, originally related to the uh, Pentateuch, uh, which is that a text tells us only about the time from which it comes. This idea holds water, but every present and every artifact has a prehistory encoded into it, and a memory and an understanding of its own past. The past, uh, to, to quote Collingwood or, or Gadamer subsequently, uh, is insuscitated into the present. It's part of the present and can't be separated from it entirely. <clears throat> Unfortunately, to discuss history, to discuss the events, um, encoded in the present, encoded in our text, uh, we need to know who's telling us the story, as Professor Friedman pointed out. And an adjustment to any one assumption about that requires adjustment to the next, like leveling a set of hangings in a house that's out of plumb. You never finish quite adjusting them so they're all level with one another and with the walls. But finally, you reach this um, moment where you say, oh, good enough um, for now. Uh, 
so, so you never really persuade another soul, at least in my household, uh, that all the paintings are level. You never really get it exactly right. Why do you think medieval metaphysics are a thing of the past? Because epistemology, beginning with Hume, like the novel with Joyce, formally acknowledged its limitations. My fear is the Exodus event belongs with medieval metaphysics. Now, it would be one thing if we just argued about dating the sources, or dating the strata, or how much garbage you could carry across the Sinai without dropping any. Um, and I believe in the existence of P, just like I believe in the behavior of electrons in cloud chambers. But when we talk about the Exodus event, we're talking about something in P. And P is, after all, an inferential entity. Um, would we talk about the Jubilee year in, in this kind of antique setting? I'm going to take one case, um, hoping not to be stopped too soon, uh, that of Amalek and, and Midian. Um, judges lumps Midian, Midian, Amalek, and Easterners together. Pentateuchal sources associate them with the Exodus. Okay. Um, I love the J thing about the, the J command that we have to wipe out the memory of, of Amalek, which is, after all, a self-working contradiction, sort of like Enoch Soames in Max Beerbohm's story. Um, historically, we have records that Saul and David fought Amalek and that Gideon fought Midian. And neither Amalek nor Midian appears as a political envy any time after those events. So why attach Amalek or Midian to the Exodus? Is the Exodus just a catch-all for all the background against which later points are to be scored? Is it a repository to acclaim David, to justify ethnicity, to introduce new laws about the harem, to justify judicial structure? Or was there an Amalek in Sinai? Or is Amalek the element that makes the, 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 the time outside of the settled land romantic? The charge of the issues makes it difficult to recognize that we are all hoping to, or despairing of, identifying a plain horse and wagon on Mulberry Street. That weary progress, the Israelite carnival. This is a biblical question, not an archaeological one. Poetic and not scientific. I think Aaron was very, very much on the, the mark here. We apply the methods of history to be sure, and so elements in our test, texts that we judge unknowable to Israelite storytellers in the Iron Age are things that require explanation and contextualization, changing geomorphology or the identification of Avaras. But if they had the 400-year Stella, we can't call on it as evidence of authenticity. It's only the stuff they didn't have that they couldn't be expected to reconstruct that has any bearing whatsoever on the question of an exodus event. OK. I was going to discuss Bill Deaver and my putting away of medieval polemics, but he's been so ironic today that I'm, I'm discouraged from going further in this, in this respect. <laughs> so I'm going to try and develop, very briefly, a thesis. Um, the thesis is, <laughs> the thesis <laughs> is that the only value of our subject is Kulturgeschichte. I'm going to return to that in a second. Scholars debate the Exodus to figure out how to reconstruct from a national myth a storytelling context. And once we're in that context, we have to reckon with constant disturbance by narrators. All our storytellers, 5,000 a year, all our storytellers and all their audiences 
contributed historical detritus while adding artistic value. We can all develop reasoned reconstructions and dozens that hold no appeal. We can answer the, we can't answer the question, sorry, the Exodus story and the historical Exodus, the relationship. For even when archaeological inference coincides with textual, other coincidences of archaeological with textual constructions are going to be possible. We're addressing questions here far more basic than Omeride politics. This is not the God particle. It's string theory, 19 dimensions, and dark energy. We are way beyond our capacity to do analysis on this subject. The question we always need to ask is, <laughs> what do we need to know in order to know what we want to know? If we can't answer that question, we shouldn't be in the business of asking the question that inspired it in the first place. Okay. Let me give you a hypothetical. Let's say we have an ocean of DNA evidence from bones in the Delta and tombs in Israel and Iron too. There's a match. Let's make it perfect. We can affiliate 40 Egyptian cemeteries with 200 Israelite tombs. Okay. Can we say we found the community of the Exodus at whatever time? Or do we still need more data? Winston Churchill once responded in question time to an inquiry on rearmament. He said, my friend puts me in mind of the gentleman who was cabled for instructions about his mother-in-law's death in Brazil. He wired back, <clears throat> embalm, cremate, bury at sea, take no chances. <laughs> When will it be enough when we are taking no chances? Welcome to the world of taboo. The Nazis, the Exodus, the conquest, David, Vegans, creation, resurrection, or the Boston Red Sox. Each is an issue of identity. The ethos of our dis discussion has been to come compartmentalize ancient identities from our own. Sometimes that membrane just doesn't hold. Why do classicists talk about a Trojan War? What's this fascination with the idea, with myths of origins? It's identity. Everyone in the Mediterranean world is archaizing in the Neo-Assyrian era and after, and some are throwing national history into LB because they exaggerate their own antiquity. Southern Mesopotamians, <clears throat> And Egyptians patrol larger outfields with omens running to Sargon, forgeries to Manistushu. We have a signet ring of Ahab from the first century CE. You don't need to forge the ark, just a saleable souvenir, an object that replaces souvenir, an object that replaces a journey. Hundreds of arcs? I doubt it. They sold like hotcakes in the markets of ancient Israel. As with some souvenirs, such as Deuteronomy, the renewal, rejection, or renegotiation of traditional identity can be stunning in its import. Jeremiah says Yahweh will no longer be known as the God who brought Israel out of Egypt, but as the God who gathered them from the lands to which they were scattered by Mesopotamian powers. The exodus as a national myth is to be supplanted by a return from exile, or the appeal of the exodus as a national myth is the regular presence of such a need. Yet just that re reformulation explains what the exodus is good for. What's so great about leave leaving Egypt and its seductive flesh pots? I always get that word wrong in meaning, by the way. Yahweh doesn't, <laughs> Yahweh doesn't evict you. Yahweh installs you. The, the Exodus is the prequel to the possession of Canaan, and the, the question of Professor Osman was, was dead on. The patriarchal narratives, they don't front the Exodus as an incentive. They, they mention it as kind of a delay in between, um, you know, in between the promise of the land and its fulfillment. 
The Exodus has cool, funny stories about Egyptian dupes and marks. I mean, it's raining frogs and the Egyptians hardly notice. The conquest attracts short, dull shrift. The, the Jordan splits, a wall falls, the Gideonites dress up for a party, probably cross-dress. And finally, the sun stands still, but the rest is a yawn. When do Israelites celebrate Matzot? J, as Professor Friedman says, already places it with the Exodus. But American scholars routinely compare the Exodus to the Pilgrims, Thanksgiving, later adopted by the state. But even Pil Puritans, even Puritans, with their blarney about persecution in England, can't name the day the Mayflower was built, or set sail, or from where, or specify which of the 40-odd Mayflower sailing ships it was. Thanksgiving sanctifies the settlement. It celebrates colony. Where is the Israelite festival of the conquest? Who celebrates leaving? Is Israel Nora in the dollhouse? Is this story just background, like the patriarchal narratives, for normative elements in the culture from which the Pentateuchal sources stem? Another thought experiment. The exodus is never suffered from the conquest because no one was grateful to leave cultivated land. But in Lotus Land, storytellers had latitude to indulge their imaginations and cover to sneak coded messages into their will work. So P, naming names, gets downright mystical at Sinai and in the construction of a cosmological sanctuary that was actually mobile. The Exodus story is like ancient history recovered late in Babylon through the archaeology of Nabopolassar, Nebuchadnezzar, and especially Nabonidus, but also their predecessors. It is photo mieux, itself a tapestry, artistically, unlike, not unlike, that more sophisticated one at Bayeux, detailing currents in ancient culture. To return to the Exodus' story, Jay imagines boils. Professor Friedman has the merit of having identified a cycle of trickery in Genesis running into Exodus, deception for deception, as he calls it. It continues with tricky midwives, with tricky interpretations of what throwing into the river means, and finally, in the form of a trickster god. Egyptians built wonders. They husbanded wealth and power. Yahweh befuddled them. Joseph could read dreams, and Egyptians couldn't. J, E, and P have Yahweh stiffen the pharaoh's resolve, and not because he's a Nufi or East Frisian. The Israelite sense of humor deserves study here in the sense that the history of our own sense of humor, however distasteful that is, does. Uh, my vision, and I frankly would not share it if I thought it remotely marketable, is the Bible, the sitcom, with Yahweh as the eldest of the Billy Goats gruff. I want to close on a, on a serious note. Sorry. Um, take the view, the experiment, last one, that P2 was writing children's literature. But he mistook his audience. The earth was void and empty, and darkness, or the purchase of Machpelah, or the spy story. OK, Muffy. So they decided to check out their land. So Moses sent them from Paran at Yahweh's command. Got that, Muffy? No, at Yahweh's command. Never mind what that twerp in Deuteronomy says. All of them were men. They were chiefs. No, no girls. No scout. I don't know if they had to, to J.E.P. into the wind. Anyway, from Reuben, they picked Shamua, the son of Zakur. Remember that name? And from Simeon, there was a guy named Rudolph, son of Rassendil. And from Judah, OK, children would be climbing the walls listening to this stuff. What P is, is a geek designing Dungeons and Dragons, tackling que questions about time travel, insisting on numbers and names of tribal leaders to be immortalized as characters only. He would have, a century ago, have been a member of the Baker Street Irregulars. But in good Mesopotamian manner, he would compile menus and manuals and samples of clay. He would live in a fantasy land and express the need to master its every complexity. P goes from children's game, children's literature to children's games with their elaborate rules. If you don't share his passion, 
P drives the wooden stake into the heart of the exodus. It is homo usios. Until P, you don't even think to believe miracles. He's the axial moment in the, in the transition of this culture. And he's the reason our plagues stink. The Chad Gadya, or I don't know why I swallowed a fly, uh, theory of the plagues. Ridley Scott, or the authors of Final Destination 10, would have provided much more entertaining plagues. Perhaps it's our job to see instead what's magical about it, to recover the lyric if our aim at all is to understand the culture that immortalized the exodus. It is perhaps the calling of the next generation to understand the exodus again as a fairy tale. Thank you. Well, since I doubt that that talk raised any questions at all, we'll move along.